I'll just start off by asking you, this season saw a very sort of a, a different development for Jon uh, Snow, who sort of hadn't been involved in much of the uh, political machinations and things of Game of Thrones. And this year saw him north of the wall, where we've got a king north of the wall and uh, all sorts of decisions he's having to make who he aligns with and things like that. Uh, what was that change in direction for your character like? I think um, it's always, I mean, he he's... he's you know, for three seasons, been separated from everything that goes down south of the wall, and obviously from across the the narrow sea with Daenerys. So he's in his own world up there. And um, I think what was strange this season uh, was what with episode nine happening and and the red wedding, etc. And I kind of I'm looking in a strange way, looking forward to next season to see how you know if he reacts to that, how he reacts to that. But he knows nothing about his brother's wall or the Lannisters or anything because he, he's not even at the wall where he gets messages sent from down south. So it was interesting to play in that he he doesn't have any clue and, and he's he's got to be on his own agenda, which is being a spy within the wildling community and 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 all the problems that he faces with that in, in deciding where his loyalties lie. And I think the massive test for him this season and the thing that was really interesting to play was that the uh, the, the thing that every spy feels, I guess, is, is when you live within a community for so long, you start to forget really who you are and, and why you're there and, and where your loyalties do lie. And, and I think what with Egret as well um, coming into play, um, he had real trouble uh, or it, it was interesting to play. His, his real emotional trouble is to deciding what he should do, whether he wanted to be free, whether all those choices he made about joining the Night's Watch in the first place were, were you know, were really a good idea. Um, but it, yeah, it was that was the interesting thing this season, and it was always the one I was looking forward to when reading the books was was that spy story. And do you think how close do you reckon he was to uh, to to turning? I think pretty close. I uh, I talked a lot to the various directors about it, and to David and Dan, and I obviously have my own take from from the books and and from what I read in the series. And there was actually a scene that was um, was lost in the cutting room um, for for various reasons, I think, uh, where you see him asleep with Igreet and he he walks away from her and looks at the wall and then he walks back and joins her again. And he could have left at that moment and he didn't. And I think they took that out for various reasons, but um, I think they were right to. But I think that scene had you seen it would show that he was really he was really torn as to as to what to do as to which way to go um and i think yeah i think it's egret mainly that that was the problem for him but in the end he he's you know the heart of it john is is a person who sticks to what he says he'll do and and those that all those months ago he made that that um that choice to say the words that he said and to swear by his brothers and what i really love about him in some ways and it's infuriating about him is that he um it, he's he's really stubborn at the heart of it when it comes to his morals and who he is mm. no definitely and how, however he doesn't completely stick to uh, everything he uh vows this season because uh we see john snow's first uh, sex scene in Game yeah. of Thrones this year with Egret. Um was, was that um I guess that was a perk of uh, being a spy? Yeah, I think he puts it down to being a perk of a spy. I don't <laughs> have to see I have to see whether he, he tells his brothers and, and, and commanders <laughs> at the wall about that or whether he keeps it close to his chest. We'll see whether he does. But I don't know, I think that was inevitable. You know, he um he he just this woman throws himself at him and mm. he's never really experienced anyone quite like her. And uh, he tries not to and you see him in season two avoid doing the inevitable. And um, even as they're about to kiss, he says that we shouldn't. And at that point, you know, his his, his real sort of male instincts kick in and, and I'm glad he does, I think. You know, he did. He made the right choice, and 
it leads to complications along the line. But it's one of those, I love that scene because it's a, a beautiful scene within a horrible story in many ways. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a real moment of love and tenderness that we, uh, me and Rose, who plays Egret, wanted to sort of try and capture. And um, and yeah, I think I think it was one of those those scenes that was really important. And I'm glad he did as a character. I'm glad he did that. And um, yeah, it's very cold north of the wall too. It probably is. <laughs> Seems silly to send all those men north of the wall with that. Um, <laughs> that's the the last place you want an oaf like that. Um, so Kit. Um, also, I, I guess and you talk, touched on this too. Sort of how there's so much that Jon Snow doesn't know. Uh, you know, all this stuff going on in King's Landing, all the stuff going across in the East, and all, all these sorts of things. But I guess there's also, uh, for uh, Jon Snow, there's so much he knows that people south of the Wall don't know. So you're sort of playing this character with all this knowledge that the rest of the show doesn't know about, but at the same time, uh, none of the knowledge that the rest of the show knows about. What's it like with all that knowledge, but without any at the same time? I think it's um, it's really interesting. It's it, at the start of the season. He he says to Mance Raider, uh I want to. I I know what's coming. I've seen it, and I want to fight for 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 the human race. Uh, I want to fight for. And that's what the whole Night's Watch is about. And I think as a part of the reason why he leaves a greet in the end is that he's seen that there's this terror coming, and he feels he has a role to play in in trying to defend. The humans from it um, and, the, and as we see throughout the second and third season until the very end is, is the rest of the kingdoms don't believe it's a myth it's something that, that won't happen and they just think it's it's the the northerners and the people at the wall talking nonsense um, and of course it's not and I think as we'll see in seasons to come it becomes more and more prevalent and, and more and more dangerous this threat from this ancient race which is awakening um i i think he he feels that he does have a role to play there and and he's gonna he's going to to be part of the night's watch and feels that they can stop it um so yeah it's it's a really interesting thing to play but he's so unaware of everything of of everything that's going down south with his family and it's a strange. I tell you what's strange to play in the series it is never really questioning anyone about his sisters or his brother, or what might be happening down there. Of course, it's a play in his head what what might be happening to them, but he he never brings it up. And I think that's part of who he is: is that he he doesn't voice his deep deep inner worries um, uh, to other people and, and and doesn't really speak about them unless he he uh, unless they're relevant to what he's doing right now it's also interesting to see i guess what his take on uh theon uh would be uh since i guess in some ways it was theon and Jon snow were sort of the two sort of outcasts that were brought up by uh ned stark outcasts for different reasons but um i wonder if Jon snow identified with theon much at all on some level and he'd be pretty upset i'd imagine to hear what went down there I think, uh, again, referring to the books, weirdly, but I remember reading the books, and there's much more made very early on about the hatred between John and Theon, okay, and, and how how and the huge animosity they feel against each other, and they are both outcasts, but um, we never really made a huge amount of that in the show. They didn't really have a proper scene together, uh, so I've still got in my head that he he hates Theon. Um, yeah. But I still don't know whether he, being, I think, essentially the good person he is, would accept what's being done to him. I think they grew up together, and given a chance, John would 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 be saving Theon, or would be trying to to help him. Um, but no, I think deep down they don't like each other, and I think John would hold against him what he did at Winterfell as well. Oh yeah, um, for, for sure. Um, so well. Uh... We've got with the Game of Thrones, and we've talked about this a little bit, how it's very different shows almost. It's almost like there's five shows within a show. Uh, you know, you've got Across the, the Sea with Daenerys, we've got You North of the Wall, we've got the King's Landing stuff, and they all intersect, and that's sort of what makes the show so fascinating. Um, but in, in one sense, uh, and we've had a few questions in our um, chat room um, uh, or in our forums about this, 
Um, and we got one from Talison that says, um, Hey, Kit, when you're doing all those outdoor scenes in the snow, do you ever get jealous of Peter Dinklage and Lena, uh, Lena Hetty for uh, having all their scenes in Cushy King's Landing? You know what? Sometimes, um, sometimes I do. Uh, there's there's times when we're on a a, a mountain in, in Iceland and it's so cold and it's brutal and and you're freezing and and all you can think about is those lucky guys in Croatia who are filming on a beach somewhere. I don't know, but I have to say I get asked I get asked that question a bit. You know, you know it looks awful where you film and aren't you jealous of the others? But if you've ever been to Iceland where we film, you you'll realise that. Uh, it has its own amazing charm to it, and I wouldn't have given, I wouldn't give up the Icelandic experience for any of those other countries. So, so genuinely, no, I'm I'm happy that I filmed where I filmed, and um, you know, it's part of John, it's part of his story. So there wasn't any other choice. I'm so I'm not jealous now. Um, Katie asks uh, on on these sort of different sort of elements of the show. She says, "Hey, Kit, can you talk a little about your production schedule?" How long does it take you to film your scenes uh, for a season? And obviously there are so many characters and storylines on Game of Thrones, but do you see David uh, Benioff and David Weiss every day uh, to bring a consistency to your arc for the season? Um, it's a good question, and it is uh, it is a huge show. So generally, you're, you're, for the second six months of the year, July to December, you're contracted to to HBO and to Game of Thrones and, and that's your job for those six months. But within those six months, it's quite sporadic when you film. It could be two days here and then you've got a week off and then you're a week on and then two weeks off. Um, because of how many storylines they have to cover and, and how much uh, they have to film in different countries. As far as, um, uh, so it's quite relaxed in that way. As far as uh, David and Dan are concerned, um, in the first two seasons, they would at least one of them would be with you on set in every single scene. And then the third season came and, and they were they decided to give themselves even more of a job and become directors as well as everything else. And in the third season, they wrote us a lovely email and they said, you know, we, we know you know all your characters this well and we have a great you know bunch of directors, so you're not going to see as much of us as you did. And we didn't. Um, but it was nice that they had that trust in us to go off and do our own thing. Um, and it did feel a bit like mummy and daddy had gone and we were left to our own devices. But we have to get used to it because I believe they're directing one in the season coming up as well. So, um, so yeah, no, we, we, they're always there. They work harder than anybody in this show. And uh, it's, <clears throat> it's lovely to see them when you do, but I kind of understand that they've got a direct one now. So you, you don't see them as much nowadays. Uh, we had uh, T. Clark. Uh, you had a big scene uh, this year in uh, Game of Thrones. That was the big wall climb, uh, where, you, where you climb the wall. Uh, very exciting. And uh, T. Clark asked, was the wall climb physically challenging? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've not done much in my short career uh, more challenging than that uh, sequence. It was amazing, but... It was one of those uh, wow moments when you walked onto a Game of Thrones set and they built the, the bloody thing. You know, they um, they built this 50, 60 foot high plaster and wax wall that we uh, we climbed up with real ice picks and were winched up. But it, it got very, I mean, we had about three or four days to shoot that entire sequence, which is, you know, it seems like a long time, but it's not to do something like that. Um Again, I've got great, great fond memories of it, but it was exhausting. It, it was very exhausting and physically demanding. And there were a lot of times you were hanging off a harness, you know, 30 feet foot off the ground, dangling by your... And they would give you enough slack that you, ha you had to actually climb the wall as, as you went. So it wasn't faked in any way. Um, so, yeah, it was exhausting and it was amazing to do. Um, I'm hoping John doesn't have to climb the wall again, put it that way, but <laughs> once was enough, but it was um it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um something yeah, that was just a, such a good moment. And we've got um Kate has asked about something else that might be a bit physically demanding on the show. So you got some fight scenes in Game of Thrones. Um have you ever had a fight with anyone in real life? 
<laughs> uh, you know what I have, uh, and I won't. I won't discuss when or where. Um, as a stupid young man in my past, I have, but um, not many. And I don't agree with fighting with people. It's a it's a bad idea. So I won't go into details. But um, I'm probably not as good as, as John is in a in a fight. I don't think. Well, you haven't had that night's watch training that uh, that John has gone through. No, I definitely <laughs> haven't. So, um, what, uh, um, so, uh, who is this? Uh, T. Clark also asked, what's been your favorite scene to act, uh, or, or film across the whole series? So, have you got a highlight of, of Game of Thrones? Yeah, what would be my highlight? Um, I think, uh, season two, although I love this season, this season was a huge highlight for me as, as a, as a whole, as a whole arc. I really enjoyed this season. But there were moments of season two when we first got to Iceland, and I think there's a specific couple of scenes uh, when Jon Snow and Corrin Halfan first encounter Egret, and they have that fight on top of the uh, on top of this cliff, um, and he, he meets her for the first time. That was our first day of filming in Iceland on the second season, and it was just the most stunning location. Um, and we were with a great group of people, and we were having such an, an amazing time. I think that was a, a, a magical moment for Thrones for me. And then the second one was in season two, and it was the fight with Corrin Half. It always seems to be fights. I don't know. Um, the fight with Corrin Halfhand uh, was was an, was an incredible piece to film, and very emotional and emotionally draining. Um, and that was at the end of our Icelandic experience of season two. Uh, but yeah, it's always been Iceland for me, um, filming this. It's something about being away uh, from home with a with a film crew you know and love, and other actors who you're very close to, and you know it's it it becomes like a school trip, um, and that would be my highlight. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really good. And um, is it with all these different shows and things on on Game of Thrones? Is there an actor that you wish you could work with that you just don't get? Uh, two because of the nature of the show so many literally so many uh, I'd love to work with Charles Dance uh, I think he's fantastic I'd love to work with um, Conleth Hill um, there are actors I had sm- tiny scenes with that I wish I'd had more with like Michelle Fairley and uh, Peter Dinklage I had a few right at the start of season one, which gave me a taster for working with Peter Dinklage, and, and now I haven't since. Uh, and I mean, I could list them off. It would take me forever. Ian Glenn, uh, Jerome Flynn. I, I know all of these people because we spend time in Belfast together and we, we're all doing a show together, so I know them as friends. But um, I, it's weird. I, I've had small amounts with some of them, but I wish I could have worked with, with lots more. Now, uh, Kit, you um, you are uh, we're an awards website at Gold Derby. We love the Emmy Awards, and uh, Game of Thrones has done uh, quite well at them last year. I think they won six uh, Emmys in the technical categories, which uh, I think uh, meant they were one of the biggest Emmy winners uh, of uh, last year. Uh, the year before, uh, they won a few less, but Peter Dinklage was able to win supporting actor. You've been nominated for drama series uh, for for both of your seasons. What's that Emmy success been like for the show? I, I, incredible, and I came into the show very naive about the Emmys. I, I didn't know a huge amount about them or uh, about what they meant for uh, for TV shows, um, both American and internationally. And I remember when uh, we first got nominated for an Emmy, and after the first season, and someone, uh, one of my agents, rang me up and said, "Oh, congratulations!" And I got all these emails saying congratulations, and I didn't really fully understand exactly what that meant. I was like, oh, great, we got nominated for an, an Emmy. Um, and then when I went to them the first time, I kind of realized what it meant for a show like ours and, and the recognition that it, it gave the show and, and how it elevated to a certain extent. Um, so, yeah, I've become more aware of them. And uh, I, I I think that, you know, I, I'm really hoping that the show gets nominated again this year. Personally, I think it deserves to, but then I am biased. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's been amazing that we've we've had these accolations, you know, uh, and hopefully that it continues. People continue to see the the virtue in our show and the value in it. 
and obviously you've uh, you've um, oh, oh sorry, what was I going to say? Um, and obviously you uh, talked, uh, and you're on the supporting actor uh, in a drama series ballot uh, for this season uh, of the show. So I'm um, just letting people know about that. Also, um, I guess uh, the big thing uh, this season on Game of Thrones was the wet, red wedding. What was your reaction to the wed, re wedding and your reaction to the fans' reaction to the red wedding? Oh, you, um, I knew it was coming because obviously on the set and I'd read the books, so I kind of I had a, a I had a good knowledge of what that scene was, and we were all so hushed hushed about it because it's the big, you know, the it's the penultimate episode of the season, and it's the big the big one where where numerous characters get killed, and it still came as a genuinely came as a huge shock to me when I watched it, which was the surprising thing. I, and it made me, uh, I'm, I don't, I, I don't mind saying it made me a bit sort of teary. I, I, I thought that both Richard uh, Madden, Una Chaplin and Michelle Fairley's performance in that, in that episode um, were chilling. And Michelle's last, I emailed her straight away after all three of them, but Michelle, I, I thought, was it was just uh, haunting and 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 gave such an incredible performance in that last moment that it left everyone dumbfounded and and I think the reaction to it was astounding as well that everyone was uh, sort of contacting me saying how blown away they'd been by it and when an episode of TV can do that on that sort of scale to that many people it's it I th I think it, it it sort of rockets the show into a different sort of stratosphere in, in the, how it sort of it affects people in, in a very visceral way and someone showed me a clip of people on the internet reacting to it which was very funny <laughs> well not funny it was it was it was it was exciting I, I'm glad that I think David Nutter who directed the uh, the episode did an incredible job with that scene and he I, I felt afterwards, I watched it, I knew it very well from the books, I watched it and I came away thinking, oh God, they nailed it, that's great. And it sounds like I'm, I'm being, I'm just boasting about Thrones, but I genuinely thought that was one of my favourite episodes of, of TV that I watched. And I think you're right with the Michelle, but like in some ways when Rob Stark died, I wasn't as shocked, I'm sort of used to on this show, sort of the big leaders, sort of mm. maybe coming undone like a Ned Stark, but... Uh, it was really when she died, it's sort of this mother figure that you thought would reunite with uh, Arya and things like this at some point in the series. You go, boy, like, they pulled no punches in that scene. Well, I thought it was, what was so amazing about her performance and so amazing about the scene was it was gut-wrenching because you saw everything in that moment with her. You saw with her yelling and, and pleading with, with Walder Frey, you saw everything about her giving everything, saying, and she believes at that point that she's lost all her children. She doesn't know where Arya is, Sansa's probably dead, um, you know, uh, Brown and Rickon she considers dead. Uh, it's She pours everything out, and it's a mother who's lost all her children and her husband. It is the epitome of grief. Uh, and what she did in that was, was, was really show, in a fiction and a fantasy world, a real realism to 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 what a mother goes through when they lose when they lose those close to them uh, i thought it was it was it was horrible and yet i came away with a huge smile on my face because because i thought they'd done such a good job with it which was a strange feeling okay kit we've got four more questions uh one's from mrs uh for, sorry miss Bree. um hi kit how does a film filming your very first starring role in a big budget movie? Congratulations, all to success. Also, can you talk a little bit about Greenland time? When do you expect to start filming that? Yes, thank you. I'm yeah, so I'm filming Pompeii at the moment, which is going very well, and it's it's grueling. I've never done a lead in a film before, but I, I realise <laughs> realise how tiring it is now. Um, but that's going very well. Um, so I'm I'm doing that. Greenland Time is an incredibly interesting project that um, we're cross fingers, touch wood, is going to go early next year. And it's uh, pretty much a two-hander with me and Vera Farmiga. Um, and it's, uh, it's a stunning psychological thriller. Um, 
uh, beautifully written and and I, I believe it will be amazingly filmed and I, I'm just in love with the I'm in love with the with the script and have been for a while and it, it's um, in the process of, of getting to where it needs to be to be made so we're talking it's on the table at the moment and it's great for me because I've done a lot of period stuff recently and, and I kind of want to move I want, want to do something a bit different from that and it's a wonderful contemporary psychological thriller and I think it's one of those that could go to festivals and do really 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 well and really shock and stun people but uh, it's a long way off yet. Yeah. We have to see if it gets gets made and, and goes goes forward from there. Now, uh, Kit, uh, our next question is: um, How did you break your ankle last year? I uh, I'm not going to lie. I uh, I left my keys inside my flat and I am um, slightly over the limit and decided to try and climb up through my bedroom window to retrieve them uh, and. Um, I kind of think I probably in my slightly inebriated state thought I was Jon Snow or something at the time and, and failed and fell down and I broke my ankle and it was a, one of the biggest mistakes of my life and I don't re recommend anyone and I was very lucky that I could get back on my feet to do thrones at the time I did but uh, it couldn't have happened at a better time in some ways because I had some time to recover from it. And we've got um, we've got to follow up on that one. Um... Who did you call for uh, in the street to uh, make your friends realise you're in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Where did that question come from? <laughs> I uh, I can't remember. I I I was I was screaming, and I was left on the street for a little while because not I think everyone I either thought I was a drunk or something. Um, and eventually, my next door neighbours came out and helped me. But I can't remember who I called for. Oh no! Well, those, uh, those two questions, uh, Kit, come from uh, courtesy of Nikolai Costa Walder. <laughs> 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 He's a cheeky Dane, isn't he? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Nikolai, I call for my mum. There you go. You got it. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> so there we go. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we asked. Uh, we spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and asked him, uh, "What what would you like us to ask Kit?" Because we knew you were coming up. Um, but he but he did also want to. I can't even get my own back. That's not fair. I'm going to get him next time. Yeah, um, but uh, we, we'll, we can email you if we talk to him next year for Game of Thrones for a question <laughs> from you. Um, yeah, but uh, he also wanted to pass along that he uh, is loving your work this season, Kit, and thought you did really well in the. I think it was the episode before the Red Wedding, because I think we spoke to him before the Red Wedding. Um, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, just want to pass along that to you as well. There's another, I can't believe I'm saying that after he sat me up like that, but there's another, there's another man that I had one scene with in season one, and I've admired his work this season. I think he's been very, very strong, and I would love to, I'd love to, for John and Jamie to meet again. Mm, very good. Um, yeah, and, and you might, you might, he's still alive in the show, and you are too, so there's a chance of that. Um, last, last question, you got a girlfriend, Egret, played uh, brilliantly by Rosa uh, th this season, and um, I was just wondering, how long does it take for someone to go out with Jon Snow before she can just refer to him on a first name basis? <laughs> she does John always call him by his, his full name, doesn't she? Yeah. I don't know. I think I, I always kind of considered that the wildling way. They sort of, mm. I think I think it's part of how she teases him. She she constantly is referring to him by his full name and and doesn't get quite the the kind of response she wants, which is for him to snap back saying just call me John because that would be too personal. Yeah. I think uh, I don't know. I I maybe if they if he hadn't done what he did at the end of season three. Maybe she'd have started calling him John. Who knows? Yeah, she probably won't now. No, not now. I don't think she'll call him John Snow anymore. I think she'll have other names for him, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, th thank you. So thanks so much for your time, Kit. Um, or uh, just uh, Kit Arrington. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for that. Um, and uh, all the best of luck with Game of Thrones Season 4 with uh, the Emmy Awards coming up for uh, both yourself and the show.
Thank you. Good speaking to you. Yeah, great speaking to you too.